So pH scale, I know you are familiar with it. Seven is neutral. Anything less than seven is considered acidic. We call it low pH is acidic. Anything above seven is alkaline or basic. And we say that it's a high pH. Our blood should not be acidic or basic. It should fall in the range between 7.35 and 7.45. It should never be higher or lower. And so when it's below 7.35, we call this blood acidosis. When it's above 7.45, we call it blood alkalosis. And we're going to get even more detailed than this um, in a little bit. So the pH of blood, uh, so just a quick reminder, what is pH? pH is the negative log of the concentration of hydrogen. So those hydrogen protons, right, H plus, okay. If you, like I said, if your blood pH is less than 7.35, it is considered to be acidosis. And if it gets to seven or lower, it can actually be fatal. And you might wonder why, why would that be true? Well, your central nervous system will become depressed. It's not active enough it can lead to a coma or death. You can also think about all your proteins. What have we learned about? Proteins carry out uh, function, right? Within cells, um, and then also you have messengers between cells, right? Everything's function is based on its specific folding. So if you become too acidic or too alkaline, you start to interfere with the ability of these proteins to maintain their shape and then they lose their function, right? They become denatured. So sometimes they just slightly get a very, very slight change um, and are not denatured and other times it's completely un unraveled, right? So uh, that just depends on how severely you've um, changed the pH away from the optimal pH of the protein. Of course, most proteins in the body will have the optimal pH as body temperature, but some, some of these proteins, their optimal pH is actually slightly higher, slightly less. So it's not a 100% catch-all for all proteins, but definitely the majority. Okay, moving on. If you go to a pH gets above 7.45, you become uh, too basic or alkaline, then we call it alkalosis. And of course, above 7.8 can be fatal. So like I said, too acidic or too basic, same problem. But in this case, when your blood pH becomes too alkaline, it actually will over excite your central nervous system, can cause all your muscles to um, flex, become stuck on, so we call that muscle tetany, right? Extreme nervousness, convulsions, and death. So these are actually the same symptoms of tetanus, right? Um, so that's interesting. Okay, moving on. Acids, what is an acid? An acid dissociates in water, meaning it falls apart or splits into pieces. And the piece that we care about is the proton, the H plus, okay? So an acid dissociates to release or donate a proton. If you have an increase in protons, then that makes a decrease in the pH because of that negative log relationship um, that we saw a minute ago, okay? Strong acids will completely dissociate. So all of the protons are released and an example of that is uh, hydrochloric acid, HCl, which you're familiar with, stomach acid. Um, weak acids partially dissociate. Uh, that's why they're weak, because they don't give off all um, of their protons, right? Some, so carbonic acid is an example, and some of the carbonic acid is going to remain as carbonic acid, and then some of it's going to dissociate and we'll see what that looks like in just a second with our acid base um, equation. Okay, so acids are made as a result of metabolism. So uh, cellular respiration, right? 
um, to get energy, but then also we have, um, we build things as well. So acids are, are produced as a result of all of our metabolic reactions. Fatty acids, lactic acid, and carbonic acid. All sorts of acids. So strong versus weak. I told you strong acid completely dissociates a weak acid partially. So here's a strong acid, HCl, and you put that in water. So when you have it, it's a solid, like it looks it looks similar to either a powder or a salt um, crystals. Okay, so it's a solid. And then you stir it into water, you dissolve it. Um, and this is what will happen. You will have every single proton will come off of the CL and they will be separate. And so now you have a huge amount of these free protons in solution. And so that's going to give you a very low pH, right? It's going to be very acidic. However, a weak acid, like carbonic acid, some of it remains whole. So it's weak because it only some of them dissociated. It's a weak acid because you're not very acidic. You only have a few protons here compared to all of the ones over here. Okay, hopefully that gave you a nice visual. Okay, same principle for bases are the same idea with looking at the concentration of hydrogen to determine your pH and the same concept of having a strong and a weak base where the strong base completely dissociates and the weak base only some of it dissociates. Um, so to demonstrate the principle of a base, because it's um, it's not as obvious, right? So we are going to decrease the concentration of protons because the base will dissociate and it will accept or bind to the free protons in solution, thus lowering the proton concentration and raising the pH. So let's go ahead and look at that. So how do bases make pH more basic. So first you have a beaker of water and you know that some of our water H2O naturally dissociates on its own and so in a neutral glass of water you're going to have some protons floating around. Okay then you add a, a base sodium hydroxide, okay, and it completely dissociates, right? So here we just showed two individual molecules of it. So Na plus, OH minus, Na plus, OH minus, but those OH minuses immediately bind to the proton and make more water. So now we only have one proton instead of three, and of course in an actual glass of water, there's millions and millions and millions of molecules, right? We're just looking at a few as an example. All right, so in this way, you went from neutral, equal amount of protons and, and um, well, that's not the correct way. The correct way to look at neutral is that you have a concentration of protons that when you put it into the equation, you get a pH 7, right? Um, and then when you add your base, it dissociates and takes up some of those free protons. And so now you have fewer free protons. And now, because you have fewer, you, have, you will get a higher number when you plug that into your equation you'll get a number higher than seven, and so then the pH is basic. Okay. So bases take up free protons, thus lowering the concentration of protons and raising the pH. Buffers, we looked at this already, I feel like. <laughs> um, I could be wrong. 
but buffers are used to prevent dramatic changes in the proton concentration when there's an acid or a base that's added to the solution, the buffer will maintain the, the, okay, so the buffer will maintain the pH so that even when you add an acid or a base, it won't have much, if any, effect at all. And you're going to, and I know why I felt like I already talked about this. I was preparing your lab last week, the beginning of last week, so I feel like I already taught you this. <laughs> but you will see in your lab, the labs that you do this week, um, you will look at a solution and you'll look at a solution of just water and you'll look, so it's really not a solution, it's just water. And you'll compare that to water with a buffer. And then you will add drops of acid and see how the pH changes and you'll drop, um, you'll, then you'll put drops of a base and see how the pH changes. And uh, you'll compare just water to water with a buffer and see how, uh, the pH doesn't change much at all when you have a buffer, um, but the pH will change dramatically without the buffer, okay? So that's the principle here is that buffers prevent dramatic changes in pH, okay? Buffers are always a combination of a weak acid and a weak base so that they can go in whichever direction you need it to go to, so whether if you add an acid or you add an add a base, you will be covered. So if the solution becomes acidic, the weak base is going to be used to take up those extra protons, so counteract the problem. If the solution becomes basic, the weak acid will be used um, to take up, uh, basically to release more protons, okay? So buffers continued. Let's see the visual. So here you have unbuffered sodium solution and you add some hydrochloric acid. So this could, could have just been plain water, right? But we went ahead and just made a salt solution because you know that your blood is not pure water, right? You, we don't give IVs of water to people, we give IVs of saline solution. So this just makes it a little bit more medical, right? And you add, let's say you add an acid, you add, uh, in this example, we're saying three individual molecules of acid. Again, that's just an example for the visual, okay? And it's a strong acid, so it's gonna completely dissociate. So it breaks apart into red and black and of course the red would represent sodium just like it did here so now you have a lot of sodium ions but now you also have all of these black particles are protons so you didn't have any here and now you have some here so you have added to the concentration of protons, H plus, and so now you've become more, more acidic, okay? So, so sodium, NaCl, is not a buffer because you changed your proton concentration and you became more acidic. However, if you look at a solution with a buffer, then you'll see that, okay, you have some protons, I'm sorry, you have some um, Cl, the little yellow halves, um, you have a couple of um, HCO3 minus, and then you still have some whole pieces in there. Then you add your acid right here, same amount, three of them, and they dissociate completely. But now, some of these free pieces are going to combine with the black that you just introduced. 
So now you only have one free proton compared to three. So you have, you have become slightly more acidic, but here you became much more acidic, right? An increase of three compared to an increase in one, okay? Would you like $3,000 or $1,000, right? So here you could think about it as, I know when you look at these numbers one and three, they don't seem very different, but when you re remember that molecules are not individual, you wouldn't just have one or three molecules. We're talking on the billion scale, right? So the difference between three billion and one billion is huge, okay? So here, you just uh, changed your pH dramatically. Here you have a very small change in pH, okay? Um, what else did I wanna show you about this? I think that's it. Okay, so in the body we have uh, several different chemical buffer systems. The most prevalent is the bicarbonate buffer system. And so we have our weak acid, the carbonic acid, H2CO3. You have to memorize that. H2CO3 is carbonic acid and is a weak acid. We can easily change the concentration of carbonic acid in the blood by changing our respiratory rate. Okay, um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Then some of this is going to dissociate, right? It's a weak acid, so some of it dissociates. And you'll see the bicarbonate ion, HCO3 minus bicarbonate ion, and it's a weak base. And a high concentration of this is maintained in the blood, and the kidneys are responsible for maintaining this concentration, okay? So let's talk about this equation. Let's see, are we gonna, yeah, okay. What just happened? It's the same slide. Okay, so here at the bottom I asked you, what is the acid-base balance equation? I showed this to you a couple times in previous lectures and said you need to know this for when we go over acid-base balance. So here it is. CO2, which comes from metabolism, right? All of your tissues, and then water. It So CO2 from metabolism, waste product of metabolism, is going to recombine with water to form this bicarbonate, well, the weak acid, carbonic acid. And then because it's a weak acid, some of it's going to dissociate and you're going to get the, the weak base, the bicarbonate ion, okay? So the more CO2 that you produce in your tissues, the more carbonic acid you'll produce and the more bicarbonate ion that you'll produce. Okay, hopefully you, feel, you were answering with me. <laughs> okay. Um, now, it can go in the opposite direction as well, so we'll look at that, but let's get the basics down first. So we talked about this. Um, okay, so I said you can change your carbonic acid concentration by slowing your respiratory. Um, easily make carbonic acid by slowing your respiratory rate. And so what I mean is if you breathe a lot, okay, so you, this, let's back up, CO2 produced in your tissues, then it goes into the blood, and it goes into the blood in the form of carbonic acid, and then it's going to travel to your lungs, and it will be made back into CO2 so that you can exhale the CO2, okay? So if you exhale a lot, then you're going to get rid of a lot of CO2 and you're going to suddenly have much less carbonic acid in the blood because you're getting rid of it very quickly, okay? So if you slow down your breathing, 
you're going to retain more CO2. And the more CO2 that you retain in your blood really means that you're retaining more carbonic acid in the blood. And because this is a weak acid, it means that you will have more dissociation and you will have more protons and more bicarbonate ion. So the concentration of carbonic acid is directly related to your respiratory rate. You breathe a lot, you will have less. You breathe a little, you will have more. So you can shift to the right and you can shift to the left. Okay, so that's why we have these double arrows. We'll come back to that shifting right and left in a moment, okay? Um, so carbonic acid is the middle part of the equation. It's the weak acid. It will dissociate, not all of it, but some of it will dissociate into the proton and the bicarbonate ion. Your kidneys can then take this bicarbonate ion and get rid of it, okay? Or allow it to stay, okay, in the blood. And we'll also revisit the function of the kidney. Okay, so other buffer systems in the body, we have a protein buffer system. This is actually the most plentiful, but not used quite as often, right? It's most plentiful because we have trillions of proteins uh, all of our cells have proteins, right? But there's not a lot of protein in the interstitial fluid recall, right? And that's where the CO2 is going, right? It's going to leave the cells, um, it's gonna leave the tissue, go into the interstitial fluid. So if you have all this protein inside your cells, but your CO2 is out in the interstitial fluid, then this buffer system's not going to work very well for our blood, right? It, so it, it might help the cells themselves to maintain uh, pH, but once that CO2 leaves, goes into the interstitial fluid, your protein buffer is not in the interstitial fluid. Okay, so most plentiful, but not used as often. Uh, used in intracellular fluid um, and plasma, but not the interstitial fluid, okay? So why plasma? Because you have some proteins in your plasma. You have a lot of proteins inside of your cells. You have some proteins inside your plasma and you have very, very little in the interstitial fluid. Okay, you already know that. Okay, so COOH, end of the protein, right? So a lot of proteins have these COOH ends um, and that can act as a weak acid and donate that proton can just pop off and become COO minus. Um, we also have a lot of um, amino acid, you know, NH2 ends of proteins, um, and those can work as a weak base by taking on another uh, proton becoming NH3 plus. So this does happen inside of your cells and a little bit inside of the plasma. Okay, but again, this, the primary buffer system that we rely on in our blood to maintain our blood pH is the bicarbonate buffer system. Okay, next, we also have hemoglobin, okay? And hemoglobin can, remember, is in your red blood cells or more appropriately, erythrocyte. Okay, so the hemoglobin can donate protons like an acid when it binds to CO2. And remember, I talked about this in the last lecture um, that you will have some CO2. Oh, so if you didn't watch, then you will want to watch that Zoom because it wasn't a lecture. I used um, Dr. Hayes' lecture, but then I did a recap or a review of respiratory um, in the Zoom session and I posted that. So make sure you watch that. Okay, so you learned that you have some CO2 that will bind hemoglobin. Okay, so you do donate a proton from hemoglobin when that happens. Um, accept a proton like a base when it becomes 
the functional hemoglobin, right? The reduced hemoglobin. And, and I also talked about that. This is um, coming from the iron. And then it stays in that um, form uh, as it circulates through the body and uh, takes on and releases oxygen. Okay, so again, go watch the Zoom review. Okay, and then lastly, we have a phosphate buffer system. This is primarily used in our urine um, and in the intracellular fluid. Okay, so NaH2PO4 is sodium dihydrogen phosphate. It's a weak acid, so it's gonna give off one of those hydrogens, right? And then you also have, it looks similar, but it is different, um, Na2, so disodium, HPO4, right? Um, so disodium hydrogen phosphate is a weak base. It will be able to take on a proton. And so these are actually just the different versions of each other, right? So you can go back and forth between this and that, this and that. Okay. Next, respiratory system control of pH. So I told, the first thing I told you about our um, bicarbonate equation is that our respiratory rate, right, if you slow it down, you retain your CO2. If you speed it up, you get rid of it. So you can alter the pH of your blood by changing the concentration of CO2 you change the concentration of CO2 by breathing more or less. So let's look at those. So again, remember your equation. Write this a lot. Identify what each part is called, right? So bicarbonate ion, carbonic acid, you know CO2 and you know um, water and you, you know this is a proton, okay? Okay, so if you get rid of a lot of CO2, you you breathe it out of your lungs quickly. This is going to cause the whole equation here to shift to the left. And what we mean is that you'll have more happening in the left direction. So think about these arrows pointing to the left. So you're going to lose bicarbonate ion because you're going to reform carbonic acid. And then that's going to also decrease as it turns back into CO2 that you exhale in your lungs, okay? So if lots of CO2 is blown out of the lungs, you're gonna shift to the left, and then that's going to decrease your overall concentration of protons, right? Because this carbonic acid forms from this. These recombine together to make this. So now you have less protons Okay, so proton concentration will decrease. What does that do to your overall pH? Increase, good. So when this happens, when you breathe out too much CO2 and you shift everything to the left, you decrease your proton concentration and you increase your pH, so if your pH increases, it's alkaline. And so this is respiratory alkalosis. It's a problem with respiration, allowing your blood to become too alkaline, right? You breathed too much CO2 out respiratory and it became alkaline, respiratory alkalosis. And to fix this problem, uh, if able to, you would want to slow your breathing down, right? But usually if there's a, enough of a problem with the uh, respiration, you're not going to be able to just correct it with respiration. And so you would need your kidneys to correct the problem, okay? Um, now, what if instead of breathing too much, what if you breathe too little? So if too little CO2 is released from the lungs, then it'll shift in the other way. So you're holding on, you have a bunch of CO2, you're gonna make a lot more carbonic acid, and then you'll have more to associate into the bicarbonate ion and the proton. So the concentration of protons are going to increase. 
and the pH is going to decrease. And so we call this respiratory acidosis because now you're holding on to too much CO2 and your blood becomes acidic. Okay, how are you doing? It's actually, it's going to be fun. I know at first it's overwhelming, but it, it gets really fun. Okay, so interesting fact, if a person is locked in a completely sealed room, you've probably seen this in movies or TV shows, and they talk about, oh, there's not enough oxygen, we're gonna run out of oxygen, right? Everyone's talking about oxygen. You're actually gonna die from carbon dioxide poisoning before you have oxygen deprivation. So yeah, what's the difference? Um, you're gonna, you're still gonna die, right? From not having adequate air supply. But it's because your CO2 that you exhale will build up in the room faster than you would actually run out of oxygen in the room. So kind of interesting. All right, so renal regulation. We just talked about respiratory um, on the previous slides. So now renal. So look at this picture. You have your blood and it's your capillary right next to your proximal tubule. So inside you have your filtrate, okay? And I know this looks really crazy. I want you to focus on bicarbonate ion, whether you're in the blood or you're in the filtrate. So in this picture, the bicarbonate ion is able to be secreted or absorbed. So if you go from filtrate to blood, you are reabsorbing it. So the bicarbonate ion is able to be reabsorbed into the blood and we do not see the reverse happening. So that's important. What else from this picture? Well, we see a lot of protons um, are actually able to be going into the filtrate. So that's secreted from the blood into the filtrate. Okay, so you're able to secrete protons. Do we see the opposite happening in this picture? No. Okay, so takeaways. Bicarbonate ion, reabsorption only. Okay, you can reabsorb the bicarbonate ion from filtrate into blood. Remember, reabsorption. You cannot secrete the bicarbonate ion. So it will never go from blood to filtrate, okay? So your kidneys can help increase the amount of bicarbonate ion, but they will not decrease it. Um, sure, okay. So you can reabsorb bicarbonate and the kidneys can help you to get more bicarbonate into the blood, okay? Now, um, the next thing we talked about, protons, okay? So protons can be directly secreted from blood into the filtrate. So you can secrete excess protons into the filtrate but you cannot reabsorb them. You cannot reabsorb protons, okay? So they only go from blood into the filtrate secretion. All right, so hopefully you wrote that down. Renal regulation, continue. So proton secretion, right? If you have too many protons in the blood, you can dump them or secrete them, right, into the filtrate. Um, now, this says if the concentration of protons in the blood 
So if you increase the concentration of proteins in the blood, you will increase the rate of secretion. So when it says opposite is true, please be careful with this. What we mean is you can slow down the rate of secretion, but you will not reabsorb. Okay, so please, please take note when it says opposite is also true. It does not mean going in the reverse order. It just means if you don't have enough protons in the blood, then you will slow down or stop secreting them. Okay, because when you secrete them, you get rid of them in the urine. Okay, so you can control how much secretion happens. Now for bicarbonate, you control the reabsorption rate. So if you have a lot of protons in the blood, you're going to want to reabsorb your bicarbonate so that you can neutralize that, right? So when you start to have an acidic blood, you want to increase the reabsorption of bicarbonate ion. When it says opposite also true, this means if you didn't have enough protons in the blood, you would not reabsorb the bicarbonate. Okay, so what I said on the last slide is super important. You only secrete protons and you only reabsorb bicarbonate. Okay, NH3 can bind to H plus and be released in the urine if uh, pro proton levels are too high in the blood. So that's an, another way that the uh, kidneys can help get rid of too many protons in the blood. To, so if your blood's acidic, you can quickly adjust and bring it back to your 7.35 to 7.45 range. Okay, so example time. If there is metabolic acidosis, so what does that mean? Well, we're talking about the kidneys. We're talking metabolic. When you hear the term metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis, it means that there's a problem with the kidneys not regulating your pH correctly, okay? So if there's metabolic acidosis, the kidneys have allowed the blood to become acidic. So you're going to need uh, the opposite part of this system to kick in and get it straightened out. And so if the problem is the kidney, then you're going to need your lungs to fix it. So the compensation is respiratory alkalosis. So you need your lungs to get the pH more alkaline, right? We need to get rid of all this excess um, protons. We need to raise the pH. So respiratory alkalosis is how you fix the problem. That's the compensation. So to do this, how do the lungs do this? The lungs need to work more, right? So hyperventilate. This will cause you to get rid of extra CO2. So you're going to decrease your CO2 levels. Oh my. Okay, sorry about that. And that looked like a telemarketer on top of all things, right? Okay, so this will decrease, right? So when your uh, lungs, when you hyperventilate, when you start compensating, you're um, performing, I guess you could say you're performing respiratory alkalosis um, by hyperventilating you will get rid of CO2, so you're gonna decrease your CO2 levels. And this should do what? If you decrease CO2, think of your equation, which direction does it move? So your equation is going to move to the left, and that means that your protons are going to decrease. Good. And so what does that do to the blood pH? It should raise it, right? Increase. That's the whole point. Respiratory alkalosis, we wanna increase the pH. 
because you have a problem. You have metabolic acidosis. Your kidneys have allowed your blood to become too acidic. You need your lungs to increase the pH, so respiratory alkalosis, okay? So a little more practice. If there is respiratory acidosis, then the compensation would be Right, it's always the opposite. So if the problem is respiratory, then the way to correct it is metabolic. If the problem is acidosis, then the way to correct it is alkalosis. So metabolic alkalosis, good. To do this, the patient needs to do what to their proton secretion, right? So we have acidosis, we have too much, we need to get rid of it. So the kidneys need to secrete or not secrete. So if kidneys secrete protons that goes into the blood, do we want that? No, we already have too much. So the patient needs to, um, sorry, respiratory acidosis. Oh, secretion, I went the back, I went backwards, oh no. Okay, so secretion is taking it from the blood, dumping it into the filtrate. So, Yes, we want to get it out of the blood and into the filtrate. So we want to increase our proton secretion. Okay. So if you get rid of excess protons, um, another thing, in addition to just getting those protons into the filtrate, you also want to reabsorb your bicarbonate ion so that it can also neutralize some of those extra protons, right? So you're going to also increase your bicarbonate ion reabsorption, okay? So proton secretion and bicarbonate reabsorption both help to get rid of excess protons and increase your pH. Okay, so the kidneys will increase the pH by secretion of protons and reabsorption of bicarbonate. All right, so what is that gonna do to your concentration in the blood? Your concentration of protons should decrease and that should raise your pH, increase. Okay, practice problem for you. On your trip to Japan last summer, when we were able to travel, uh, you climbed to the top of Mount Fuji up to an elevation of 12,388 feet. Along the way, there were small huts. They were selling snacks, water, and you saw small cans of pressurized oxygen. And you thought, that's odd. Why would they be selling oxygen for people who are outside, right? It's an outdoor activity. So as you approach the top of the mountain, you saw a male-aged man sitting along the pathway and breathing rapidly. He was obviously out of breath and he didn't look well, he looked very ill. Describe the acid-base imbalance in this man and the cause. Describe the comp excuse me, describe the compensation that he would need um, in order to correct his problem. Okay, so explain the physiology, what, what's gone wrong, and how to fix it. All right, so you probably just heard me drink water. <laughs> Hopefully you paused the video and answered this yourself. If not, pause it now. These questions help when you actually try them first. Okay, so higher elevation, less oxygen, right? So they're selling cans of oxygen because everyone knows that at high elevations you have less oxygen available. This man is breathing rapidly so if you breathe rapidly, you're getting rid of CO2. So this man has, because there's less oxygen, he's breathing faster, but the problem with that is now he's getting rid of CO2 too quickly. So now his 
blood pH has increased because he's gotten rid of protons, right? So remember that equation that shifts left, okay? So his pH is going to increase. So what is his condition? His condition is respiratory because it's from a breathing too fast and his pH increased, so it's alkalosis. So he's breathing too fast and now his pH is alkaline, blood, blood pH, okay? So how does his body fix this? His body needs metabolic acidosis, right? So the kidneys are needed to fix the problem. And what the kidneys need to do is slow down secretion of protons. So don't get rid of the protons, keep them in the blood. And then you also want to slow down the bicarbonate reabsorption, right? You don't need a bunch of that bicarbonate ion because the more of the bicarbonate ion you have, the more it's going to bind to protons in the blood. But you already don't have enough protons in the blood. You need more protons in the blood to get the pH back down, okay? So you're going to slow down hydrogen secretion and slow down bicarbonate reabsorption. So something nice about these problems is that your um, proton secretion and your bicarbonate reabsorption are always the same. You either increase them both or decrease them both. And so you just have to think about what is the problem if the problem is that your pH is too high, alkaline, it means you don't have enough protons and so you want to keep your protons. So you want to slow down secretion and then you automatically know you also want to slow down bicarbonate reabsorption, okay? All right, so that was a uh, practice problem in the form of a, um, how do I say this? Like a clinical question, right? It's um, a critical thinking question. It's in a paragraph form, okay? We will also give you questions like for the practice homework, just giving you data, okay? So looking at the arterial blood gas handout, which is in the module underneath acid-base balance in, in lecture, this is lecture homework, um, so let's go ahead and look over that, okay? So the first thing I want to talk about from the handout is the normal values and then the if it's acidic and if it's basic. Something to point out here is that the PCO2 is opposite. Um, so when your CO2 levels are elevated, that means you're acidic. If your PCO2 drops, then you're alkaline. So this is counterintuitive. Um, and notice that those arrows are going in the opposite direction as the other two values. Okay, so that's the tricky part of, of the homework. Um, but let's start with pH. Okay, so your normal pH range, 7.35 to 7.45. If you drop below 7.34, so 7.34 or anything less is acidic. If you drop below 7.35 is what I meant to say. So 7.34 or less is acidic. If you go above your range, your normal allowed range, 7.45, then anything above that is going to be basic, okay? And let's see if I can draw. Can I draw? Nope. Let's see. Pointer, change it to a pin. Good. Okay. So what I want you to do for these practice problems, you will be given a pH, a patient has a pH of such and such, and I want you to use this chart. So always redraw this chart and you will draw an arrow or a circle that shows you that it their pH is acidic or that it's basic, right? And then you're going to look at their, or, or maybe it's normal, 
right? But if it's normal, then there's not much that will be going on in that question. <laughs> okay, so you'll circle or put an arrow so you know which direction it's going. And you'll do that for each value. You're gonna look, what is their CO2 levels? Is it within the normal range? If so, good, check it off. If not, then you're going to circle which one. Is it this way or is it this way? Okay, and then you're gonna do the same thing for your bicarbonate ion. Is it in the normal range? If not, which direction, okay? So let me erase that and I actually don't know how to erase it during a slideshow. So we'll just leave that and we'll move on. Okay, so the next slide. Here's our first example. We have a pH of 7.32. Is this normal? So let's look at our normal range. 7.35 to 7.45. No, it is not in this range. Is it above? No. Is it below? Yes. So it is below. You could draw an arrow or you could circle it. I like circling. It gets my attention. Okay. So now we know that we have an acidic pH. Acidic pH. Okay. What about PCO2? PCO2 of 48. Is 48 in this range? 35 to 45, no. 48 is outside, is it here? No, is it here? Yes, it is above 46. So I'm going to circle this side. And then I'm gonna look at my bicarbonate ion. It's 25. So the normal range is 22 to 26. So yes, we have a normal range for bicarbonate. So we're gonna say yes, that's normal. And this was not normal, it was um, acidic. So we'll just say, I'll just draw an arrow for acidic, but you would write acidic. Okay, so that was the first step. We've identified that our pH is acidic, our PCO2 levels are acidic, and our bicarbonate is normal. So you wanna ask yourself, and now I wanna switch back to arrow, and actually, uh, can I type? Nope, I cannot type during a presentation. I don't know what's happening. Okay, so what does this do? Next, start subtitles. I don't, I don't want that. Uh, automatic, hidden, arrow, pen, laser pointer, highlighter, eraser, eraser, pen color. Yep, I cannot type on this, sorry guys. So you'll just have to write this down from what I'm saying. Okay, so we've identified the pH is acidic, we've identified the PCO2 is acidic, and that the bicarbonate is normal. So what does this mean? What is this person's problem? Is it a respiratory problem or is it a metabolic problem? Is it acidosis or is it alkalosis? Okay, well, we have two imbalances on the acidic side. So this is al not alkalosis, it's acidosis. Okay, so the first problem is that this person has acidosis. I think that's the easiest uh, part to identify, right? Acidosis. Okay, now you wanna know, is it metabolic or is it respiratory? And so you wanna see, okay, so the, the other value or the other um, imbalance here, in addition to pH, is PCO2. Who controls your CO2 levels? Your kidney or your lungs? Your lungs, right? Your lungs control how much CO2 uh, goes out, right? So if you breathe fast, you get rid of too much CO2. If you breathe slow, it builds up, okay? So then this would be respiratory. Respiratory. Can I just like draw? Nope. I have to use my mouse and it is not easy. Okay. Respiratory 
acidosis, okay? The problem is with the lungs, so it's respiratory. The pH is acidic, right? They're both acidic in the same direction. So it's respiratory acidosis. All right, next example. This person has a pH 7.49. Is that in the normal range? No, it is too high. It is basic. This person has a CO2 level of 40. Is that in the normal range? Yes. So I like to put a little check mark. Yes, it's normal. Okay. Then you have your bicarbonate ion is 29. Is 29 normal? No. 29 is high, right? 27 or higher. Yes, we're higher. Okay. So now you have two imbalances going in this direction, which is basic. So you have alkalosis, you're alkaline, okay? And alkaline, are you alkaline because of the kidneys or the lungs? So here we look at the lungs and the lungs are normal. So the problem is not with your lungs. In fact, you could also just look at this other imbalance here, and this imbalance is your bicarbonate. When you see bicarbonate has a problem, the bicarbonate is out of balance, you know that this is a problem with the kidney, right? So the problem, the problem is the kidney and the kidney has allowed your blood to become too basic. So your problem is respiratory, right? Um, sorry, that was our last one. So your problem is with the kidney, so it's metabolic, and then it's basic, so it's alkalosis. So your problem is metabolic alkalosis and you would need to compensate with the lungs. So you would do the exact opposite to compensate. The, so you would want respiratory acidosis to fix it. And our last example, pH 7.25, is that normal? No, it's below, so it's acidic, right? CO2, 34, is that normal? It's just a little low. So you're over here now with your CO2 level. Next, bicarbonate, 20. Is that, no, it's too low. So now you're here. So now you might be saying, oh no, this is different than what we've seen before. We have three circles. What do I do with three circles? Well, you know that the two circles that are on the same side indicate the problem, okay? So this is the problem. Just like what we saw on all the other examples. So this is our problem, and this third circle is actually the compensation, okay? I'll just put comp. So let's focus with the problem first. You're acidic, so you have acidosis, and it's caused by bicarbonate ion. So you have metabolic, so let's write a problem. So the problem is metabolic. This is so terrible. Okay, your problem is metabolic acidosis. I wish, I wish I could do better. Acidosis. I'm just gonna put acid. <laughs> okay, so your problem is metabolic acidosis. Why? Because your imbalance, the imbalance that's in the same direction as the pH imbalance, is acidic, and the one that's out of balance is HCO3 and HCO3 is controlled by the kidneys and only controlled by the kidneys. 
So it's metabolic acidosis, okay? Your compensation, so how do we fix the problem? And then with these problems, we always ask, is there compensation? So you would say actually yes, or with, right? Yes, there's compensation. So the problem is metabolic acidosis, but luckily the body has already started to correct the problem or compensate, and the compensation is respiratory alkalosis. Okay, I'm just gonna abbreviate. So this person with these values has metabolic acidosis with compensation, and the compensation is respiratory alkalosis. So what does respiratory alkalosis mean? It means that they're going to change their breathing rate to get the blood back up, uh, pH back up. So your respiratory rate is going to increase so that you get rid of extra CO2. Okay, so now it's your turn. Go to the worksheet and do your practice problems. Remember to always start by writing out this box um, so that you can circle uh, what the where these values lie. So for every single problem, I want you to draw a box and then circle where their values fall and then um, solve um, like you like we just did together, right? So you're gonna tell me what is the problem? Is there compensation, yes or no? If the compensation is present, what is it? If the compensation is not present, I still want you to tell me what it would be. So uh, you would say no compensation. If there was compensation, we would see such and such values and this would indicate blah, 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 right? Okay, so fully explain each problem. How, uh, how do you know what the answer is and what does the body need to do or what is the body doing, okay? Um, and then uh, we can go over all of those sample problems and in fact, I'll get the iPad for that day and, um, and then I can sh work out all these problems with you. Normally we're in the classroom and I just do all of this on the whiteboard. It's much easier. Um, but anyways, that's it for acid-base balance. Please do these practice problems. Uh, read the appropriate sections uh, in the book if you want further explanation. And then, um, then once you've done all this, then you're ready to start on the lab. Do the first lab is from the lab manual. It's easier, it's going to get you ready for the Physio X lab, okay? So order of operations, study the lecture, do the worksheet handout, and then do your buffer lab in the lab manual, and then do your Physio X, okay? Have a good week. I will be posting um, the reproductive slides uh, sometime this week as well so that you can get a head start on, um, on that. And then that's it, just two more lectures and you're done. All right, have a good day.